be here now. Just be here now. Welcome to the Meta Hour with Sharon Salzberg, where Buddhist wisdom meets everyday life. This podcast is brought to you by the Be Here Now Network and features interviews with the top leaders, teachers, and thinkers of the mindfulness movement and beyond. For more information, visit BeHereNowNetwork.com backslash Sharon. Hi, I'm Sharon Salzberg, and I'm in conversation today with my longtime friend and colleague, Mark Epstein, MD. Mark is a psychiatrist in private practice in New York City. He is a longtime Buddhist practitioner and seeker and received his undergraduate and medical degrees from Harvard University. Mark is the author of several books that explore the interface of Buddhism and psychotherapy, including Thoughts Without a Thinker, Going to Pieces Without Falling Apart, Going on Being, Psychotherapy Without the Self, The Trauma of Everyday Life, and Advice Not Given. His latest work, The Zen of Therapy, Uncovering a Hidden Kindness in Life, was released in January of 2022 by Penguin Press. Welcome back to the Meta Hour, Mark. Wow, Sharon, so good to be with you. It's so good to be with you. It's been a lot of years, actually, since you were last on the podcast. The last interview was in 2017, which was like 17 lifetimes ago. Wow, that's um, amazing. So we have a lot to we have catch a lot up to cover in terms of podcasts. So um, I was thinking earlier today that you're one of the few people when I can actually pinpoint the year that we met which was 1974. Yeah. Uh, other people, well, I can, Joseph, the people I met at my first retreat, like Ram Dass and Joseph, it was 1971, but there's all those decades, you know. <laughs> I think, when did I meet you? Was it, you know, 70s, 80s, something like that. But there we were uh, at Naropa Institute. So maybe we could just say a little bit about that. And since you've been on an earlier episode, which is actually episode 56, the sort of detailed backstory um, about you can be can be just on that. But I, I would love for you to say something about Naropa and, and those very early days. Sure. Well, 1974, I was still in college. Um, you, you had been in India already mm -hmm. and, and had come back. I was, I was still in college and, and, um, uh, had just discovered, I had discovered Buddhism, uh, you know, by reading about it, uh, in the several years before. Uh, I read Nyanaponika Tara's book, The Heart of Buddhist Meditation. Mm -hmm. Nyanaponika was a German Jew who, uh, left, um, uh, left Germany before, you know, right at the beginning with, as the Nazis were taking over and, and ended up in Sri Lanka and became a Buddhist uh, monk, Theravada Buddhist monk. And then the British put him in a prisoner of war camp during the war where he translated uh, Pali and Sanskrit into German and eventually into English. And uh, I started studying Buddhism, you know, in my undergraduate uh, uh, religion class, uh, met Danny Goleman, read Nyanaponika, and then uh, Danny Goleman told me, if you want to know more about this, you should head out to this place in Boulder where all my friends are going to be teaching. And I listened to him, and I went there, and there you were. Um, so I met you and Joseph and Jack uh, and began to actually uh, study not just the philosophy and psychology uh, from the books, but actually to learn to, to, uh, meditate. I learned mindfulness and Vipassana at, at the feet, at your mm -hmm. feet and Joseph's feet and Jack's feet. And, um, uh, uh, that, you know, changed my life. And uh, I, I had actually worked the, 
the summer before I had worked for uh, Dr. Herbert Benson, mm -hmm. a cardiologist at Harvard. I, I wrote it in this uh, Zen of Therapy book. I started the book by telling uh, that story. But uh, so I had worked as a, um, as his research assistant. Uh, he was a cardiologist who had studied the physiological effects of transcendental meditation and shown that it uh, uh, decreased the metabolic uh, rate and, and could lower blood pressure and relieve stress. So I knew about meditation from the academic side and from the scientific side, but not really from the personal practice side. Uh, and um, thank goodness... Thank goodness I went to Naropa Institute and, and became your friend, Sharon, because uh, uh, that allowed me to try to integrate all of that into the world of psychotherapy. Well, thank you for that. You know, Dan, Danny brought me to my first meditation retreat. Really? He's like the Pied Piper or something. <laughs> yeah. It's really kind of funny. Um, huh? Yeah, I had met him. Um, well, I, didn't, I didn't totally meet him, but I heard him speak at this international yoga conference in probably December of 1970 in New Delhi. And uh, it was really the best thing about the conference, which was kind of dismal altogether. And uh, and then here he was, you know, giving a talk. And at the end of the talk, he said he was on his way to this town called Bodh Gaya, where uh, the tree, the descendant of the tree was where the Buddha had gotten enlightened. And this man named S.N. Goenka was going to teach an intensive 10-day oh, wow. meditation retreat. And it was sort of a system known for, um, you know, being kind of the straight stuff. It was a lot of like how-to, mm -hmm. uh, not a lot of dogma, and really a lot of practicalities. And I thought, that's it. That's what I'm looking for. And so not only I, probably like 50 people from that conference ended up following him to Bodh Gaya and doing that very retreat. And Ram Dass was there as a student. Joseph was there as a kind of a student, but also a longtime resident of the place and was a little bemused by this avalanche of people coming his way where there'd only been like four Westerners ever, you know. Like suddenly Danny brought all this this crew. And so it was like uh, he has some some kind of pivotal role in a lot of things. Yeah. Yeah. He, he was, uh, he was instrumental, I think for so many people, for us personally, you know, when, when, uh, uh mindfulness was not a, uh, uh, was not common knowledge. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, and then through his, uh, writing for psychology today and the New York times, and then emotional intelligence, you know, he's really brought, uh, brought brought meditation to so many people. So let's talk about your new book. Um, here's what the New York Times had to say about it. In the Zen of Therapy, a warm, profound, and clear-eyed memoir of a year in his consulting room prior to the pandemic, the psychiatrist and author and practicing Buddhist, Mark Epstein, seeks to uncover the fundamental wisdom both worldviews share, and to show, as a practical matter, how it might help us wriggle free from the places we get stuck on the road to fulfillment. Wriggle free. I know. I was thinking, Isn't like, that nice that's in the New York Times. That's a great image, too, of like, yeah. oh no, here I am stuck. What am I going to do? Oh, I think I'll wriggle free. Yeah. Instead of like blast the obstacle and annihilate it, or yeah, that's good. annihilate myself, you know. Mm -hmm. I think I'll wriggle free. I think that's good, actually. Well, the, you know, the question that people were always asking me since I wrote my first book, which was like twenty-five years ago now, yeah. is, yeah. Um, well, how do you bring the Buddhist thing? your spiritual uh, uh, seeking, you know, how do you bring that actually into the practice of therapy? Do you mm -hmm. teach your patients to meditate? Do you meditate with them? And, uh, and I was always uncomfortable with the question because uh, I never wanted to be proselytizing mm -hmm. uh, as a therapist. And I, and I was very wary actually of, 
you, you know, overtly talking about Buddhism or meditation to my patients who were coming for, you know, all kinds of reasons of their own. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but I was very aware from the beginning that somehow w- what I learned from you, what I learned from mindfulness, what I learned from my own meditating mind was influencing the way that I was as a therapist. Um, so, so after, you, you know, wriggling, uh, free of the question for, uh, for so many years, I decided I write, I ran out of other things to write about. Mm-hmm. And so I, I decided with this book that I would try to be, answer the question, not, not superficially or not, not glibly. Um, but, but actually look inside my own practice, my own mm-hmm. therapy practice and try to, uh, put my finger on some of the ways that I did channel, uh, whatever I hopefully have learned from Buddhism, you know, in my work as a therapist. So, uh, so I decided to pay careful attention to at least one therapy session a week for a year where I thought that something interesting was happening, you know, that I was in some way, you know, channeling something or there was an opening that happened or something, some, some little something took place in the session. And I, uh, uh, I took careful notes, which is not my usual practice after the session that I I picked it out like in the middle of the session, I would be like, Oh yeah, this seems like this might be a good one. Um, and, uh, so I would take notes after the session and write it down. And then, uh, over the weekend or on Monday, when I do my writing, uh, I tried to write it up at, you know, in, um, uh, as if it were happening in real time with, with some, you know, trying to find the right words to really talk about what the dynamic was in the, in the session. And I did that for a year. Uh, So there were like 40 or 50 uh, randomly selected uh, therapy sessions, all with different patients. So it's like a mosaic of therapy, sort of, Um, with still without knowing if it was going to be a book, but it was like Mm -hmm. an exercise for me. Um, And uh, uh, it ended, the year ended unbeknownst to me just before COVID hit. So mm-hmm. it ended the the end of 2019. I was like, a year. This is a year. It's enough. Uh, and I I gathered all the material together and showed it to my editor to ask her if she thought there might be a book in it. And uh, she was uh, mildly enthusiastic, but said, you know, the the only real through line here is going to be you. So if you want to do this, I think you should go through all the sessions and tell us more about what was going on in your mind, Mm -hmm. you you know? Um, so, um, so I, I listened to her. She's like an excellent editor and I always try to listen to her. Mm -hmm. And so the, the next year, which was the first year of COVID, uh, that was my, that was my writing project was to go through each session and, uh, reflect upon it and, uh, write a commentary about it. And uh, gradually, gradually in doing that, the book came into form. You know, it, it took shape. And if, you know, we can talk about the, the shape it took more if you want. But th- mm-hmm. that's, that's sort of the background of how the book came, t- came into being. And it's a different kind of book than ones I've written before. It's a, it's, um, it's a little more, um, I think I was very influenced. Have you ever read any of those uh, Carl Ove Nausgaard books uh, that are, no. you know, oh, they're so good. He, there were like um, many volumes, eight volumes, I think, that he calls My Struggle. And he's yeah. just write, writing all the details of, uh, of uh, his life. And I, I, I want, I, in a way, I was trying to write the, the quotidian, you know, ordinary mm. details of what it's like to be a therapist and to uh, take some of the mystery away. And and uh, and so to take some of the mystery away from of, from the spiritual thing too, and to sh- to try to show how it translates just in for ordinary people in an ordinary therapy session. I think it's really a remarkable book in so many ways. 
And one of the ways is that, um, this is a little hard to describe, but uh, you almost bring the mystery back in too, in that there's, um, I, I think of a couple of things. One is how in some uh, relationship therapy uh, things, there will be one person and then another person and then the space in between. Uh-huh. which is the yeah. mystery, you know, and somehow you convey that room and the space in between, uh, which doesn't have details, you know, there's nothing to say yeah. unless you're doing the decor or something, but um, there's some mystery to that process of what happens between two people Yeah, in, in that yeah. relationship. And the other thing I thought it was actually something you taught me, when I was working on the book Faith, and he taught me about Beyond, and and um, I don't even know how to describe it anymore. You know, I've sort of incorporated it. If you can describe something of that, it's like the space, you know, it's the... That's exactly right. I remember yeah. when you were working on that book, and and um, uh, Beyond, Beyond was uh, an incredible British psychoanalyst who was actually born in India, and he was Samuel Beckett's psychoanalyst when they were both young. Uh, but he writes, uh, they, I, my title, Thoughts Without a Thinker, I, I stole from beyond. Yes, <laughs> that, that's his phrase, you know, like, like in the therapy encounter, sometimes he says there are thoughts that are floating around, you know, and who do they belong to, you know? Do they belong to the patient or do they belong to the therapist? They're like thoughts without a thinker. But that's what... It's like he he was paying attention to, it's what you're saying, he was paying attention to the space between, you know, to the interpersonal field, to that Mm -hmm. which arises between the two people, that to my mind, uh, and I think I learned some of this from you, Sharon, that that paying attention to that space, you know, the Mm -hmm. the way we pay attention to the space of our own minds when Mm -hmm. we're meditating, the thoughts come, but are we just paying attention to the thoughts or are we paying attention to the space around the thoughts, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, And it can be like that in therapy and, and, um, and there's some kind of communion uh, that happens uh, when two people can each be putting their minds in that in inter uh, um, intermittent, intercurrent, what's the right word? Uh, you know, into that interpersonal space. Mm-hmm. So interesting things, interesting things happen. So, so Beyond talked about faith as like the willingness to enter that space, I think, you, you know, with mm-hmm. the, with the belief or the faith that, um, if, if, if you didn't run away from your most destructive impulses, many of which will surface in that space, that, mm-hmm. that a, a kind of love will triumph uh, over even our most, um, I think he says, uh, uh, facing the horror of oneself. Mm-hmm. Uh, if, we're, if we're willing to face the horror of oneself, that, that some kind of life force uh, some kind of vitality. Uh, some I, I even used, you know, like what was your face? The Zen thing of what was your face before you were born? You know, like an originary intelligence. Or um, I, I quoted the Dalai Lama as saying, um, uh, "There's a a kind of vitality that is um, available to all of us if we willingly can enter that space that is the between. And I remember we talked about it and you were like, mm-hmm. you know, uh, this might be too much for me, but uh, then you ended up totally channeling it. Well, it's so exciting. Um, and I think you really kept, you really channeled it in this book. You know, it's, it's just there, even though it's not discussed as a, a theory or a concept. And it's so interesting to me too, that you, turned in the book just before the pandemic yeah. and we're, we're recording this in March of 2022, which is several years into the COVID pandemic. And I wonder if you looked back at it as you were editing or you were working on it um, with that, with that view at all. The, the interesting thing about being a therapist, uh, you know, all the way through, like, 
Um, until the pandemic hit, I was very insistent on people coming to the office and that therapy mm-hmm. had to be face to face. And when, when people traveled, uh, I would not continue to uh, talk with them therapy wise while, you know, while they were away. Um, mm-hmm. and then as soon as the pandemic hit and everything became remote and, uh, you know, all my patients were, either on the phone or on the computer, on Zoom or on FaceTime or on Skype. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they, they were in this place or that place in the country or in the city or on the West Coast or on the East Coast or in, in Europe. And I would talk to them anywhere. And th- it was a completely different experience. And yet the therapy seemed to proceed uh, just fine, you, you know? And I even took on some new people who uh, I had never met in person, but uh, made the connection and we had plenty to talk about and the therapy unfolded. And I was shocked that mm-hmm. it could be, you know, uh, different, but the same. Um, so uh, except for the fact that so much of what we ended up talking about during COVID was COVID. Um, right. it, 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 um, and, you know, isolation and fear and uh, anxiety and frustration. Uh, but all those emotions were present before for everybody. It was just co- COVID made, uh, it, um, uh, made everybody's experience much more similar. Uh, mm-hmm. in that we were all going through the same thing together, but the general texture of the therapy didn't really change because people's issues always center around those those same things. I was going to ask you that, actually, because I remember, um, well, COVID was, it reached like every household, I think, Yeah, uh, certainly in the U.S., and certainly in New York, you know, where... Um, we we're both kind of centered in a way, yeah. but um, you know, I think about other issues. I remember when nine eleven happened, and um, I was talking to a psychotherapist in uh, New Haven, and he said, you know, people come in and they're just like totally devastated, and, and some people, of course, had personal losses, and uh, but if they had not, you know. Uh, it quickly returned to their divorce or, you know, their particular issue. And I think about yeah. the world now and it, Yeah. Um, I wonder if it's kind of more knit together, like as we are recording, uh, you know, there's war in Ukraine and I know so many people who are literally glued to the television watching the news, um, which is not me, but uh, so many people and surprising people too. Mm-hmm. Um you know, people who are extremely sensitive and they think, well, I don't know that you're handling this, this, you know, this well, or people who are normally not that tuned in or tuned in. And um, I wonder if the pandemic changed us in some way, or if this too is, it's kind of a, a phase of, you know, recognition of how terrible things can be. And then we kind of go back to our lives. I, I think it's a tricky thing. I, I did notice this after 9-11. You know, my, um, my uh, therapy office is in downtown Manhattan in Tribeca. So I, yeah. was, like, I was like, you know, uh, 10 blocks away. Um, and uh, I saw a few people in the year or two after 9-11 who had lost uh, loved ones. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and, uh, and then I, you know, um, after the tsunami in 2004, I... I um, worked with people who also lost uh, entire families in the tsunami. Yeah. Um, and w- I mean, I have a couple of, uh, of conclusions from all of that. One, one is that um, while those kinds of losses seem like so impossible to relate to, so other than what, quote unquote normal people experience that the 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 Buddha's teachings, you know, in the first noble mm-hmm. truth about how there's an undercurrent of trauma that we're all 
either facing or going to face, you know, old age, illness, death, mm-hmm. loss, separation. And the, the emotional experience of those things are the same, whether it happens in one fell swoop or whether it happens, you know, at the age of 85 or something. Mm-hmm. So, so I, I didn't completely understand or believe or know that until I started working with these people who had suffered these tremendous losses. Mm-hmm. And I was like inside myself. This is part of what I think got me to write the, the current book, although this you know, obviously happened years before. Mm-hmm. But um, uh, the only way that I could uh, say relate to my patient who had lost her children in the tsunami was to realize that I had children, she had children, I knew what it was like to have children, you know. Mm-hmm. I just made her tell me about her children, mm-hmm. even because in the office, whether they were alive or dead, w- you know, was sort of irrelevant, um, you know, because the experience of having children is the same, and the experience of loss is the same. So the idea that anybody's loss is more horrific than anybody mm-hmm. else's loss, that we can't relate to somebody else's loss because it's so much you know, more than what we hope we'll ever experience, I, mm-hmm. I really felt to be a mistake. So, so, so that was like my first big, you know, what, for me, it was a revelation. It's probably obvious to people who are listening, but, um, and then the second thing, which is more in line with what you're saying about people, uh, watching the TV all the time. And that I think that there can be a tendency to to re-traumatize oneself, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know, by subjecting oneself to the news or um, uh, uh, anxious uh, stories or worst case scenarios, um, that I think there can be something slightly perverse that or addictive that keeps us scratching that itch. To, to keep us in a state of heightened uh, uh, heightened awareness, you could say. So, so um, the line between you know wanting to be up on the news and wanting to do something and wanting to and being curious about what's happening, and then also you know slightly or subtly perpetuating a sense of disease in oneself. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's it's not always easy to find the the middle ground, you know? So sometimes I find myself urging uh, uh, people who are asking me for advice to uh, temper their uh, um, their addictions in, in that way, mm-hmm, you know? Mm-hmm. That's an interesting phrase. People who are asking me for advice yes. since they're yes. in the room. <laughs> yeah, well, I, lear- I learned early on that... Uh, I could be freer in giving advice as a therapist than I thought maybe uh, was the way I was taught because people who uh, uh, don't want to take my advice won't take it even if I offer it freely. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that, that gave freedom. me a certain kind of freedom, yeah. <laughs> that is freedom. Okay, I'm going to go back to your book. Um, <laughs> you start the book with retelling some of the origin story of the Buddha with an interesting emphasis on a part of the story that's often overlooked. And that's an encounter with a woman named Sujata, which is so interesting uh, because having been in Bodh Gaya, you know, I can, I can visualize the actual spot where this was, you know, the legend says this happened. And it's one of the amazing things about being in a town like Bodh Gaya, where the descendant of the tree is, um, under which it said the Buddha was sitting when he became enlightened. Cause you can, you can look around and say, this is what he was seeing. This is the yeah. flora. This is the fauna. This is the place where he encountered Sujata. This is the place he did walking meditation. So I wonder if you can give our listeners a short summary of that uh, meeting of his and Sujata's and why you focus there as a framework in the book. Sure. Well, I mean, Sujata, Su- Sujata was a young woman uh, living in a nearby village 
to where the Buddha found himself after years of being in the forest, practicing uh, what they called austerities, which were ascetic practices, which were very popular in the Buddha's day as a, uh, an attempted route to spiritual awakening. The, the basic philosophy behind it was that um, the flesh was impure, that this physical form was tainted, that the best way to uh, become free of attachment was to free oneself from all kinds of desire, uh, including the desires of the flesh, including food and drink and so on. Um, so the, the, the Buddha, after um, uh, leaving his wife and young child in his 29th year to seek his, uh, his enlightenment, his freedom, his awakening, uh, he, he wandered in the forest for years practicing all the, all, you know, yoga was big in those days. And uh, uh, he did all the meditations, all the yogic practices. Uh, uh, he went very, very high, uh, achieved a lot of blissful experiences, but, but none that were um, uh, intense enough and uh, um, transformative enough to give him, to let him know that he had really broken free. So then he started doing the ascetic practices. Um, and uh, he ended up, like I always say, like a modern day uh, uh, patient with anorexia, you know, mm -hmm. who uh, as therapists, uh, uh, anyone who's listening will know, uh, those, um, uh, those sufferers from anorexia while their body gets very, very weak, they get down to 70 or 80 pounds, you know, uh, their will is incredibly strong. They'll, 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 they will only take the tiniest bit of food, you know, no matter what you do therapeutically, it's very, very hard to break through. So the, the Buddha was, was at a stage like that. They say in the scriptures, he was drinking his own urine. His uh, belly was uh, concave. Uh, he was falling over on himself. He was so weak. Uh, and um, uh, at, uh, at a certain moment at, when he was at his weakest, he um, uh, had a memory. It's the only time that a childhood memory comes into play in the Buddha's story. And he remembers himself as a young boy, maybe eight years old, nine years old, sitting under a rose apple tree on a beautiful day with the sun shining and the wind blowing and his father in the distance, you know, safely in the distance, leaving, uh, plowing in the fields, the Buddha uh, uh, under the tree kind of blissing out, you know, extremely joyful feelings uh, uh, running through his body. And he remembers this joyful feeling just when he's on the verge of, uh, you know, uh, fainting or uh, even succumbing, uh, even dying from starving himself. And uh, I always say it was like uh, the first uh, moment of self-analysis, you know, because the Buddha says to himself, why am I having this memory at this particular moment? Maybe this joyful feeling that I'm remembering, maybe that's the key to this enlightenment that I'm seeking and I've been going about it all the wrong way. Because to support such a joyful feeling, uh, I would need to take some food you know, a body this malnourished could never support this joyful feeling. So at this moment, uh, Sujata uh, uh, comes into the uh, Buddha's uh, field and she sees him and she happens to be carrying a bowl of uh, rice porridge because her maid had been in the forest earlier and had seen the, the withered uh, Buddha uh, there under not the Bodhi tree, but under a different tree. And, uh, the, the maid mistook the Buddha for a spirit, um, because the tree that he was under was the very tree that Sujata nine months before had uh, gone and left offerings under, uh, uh, to the tree spirit asking to become pregnant. And she had become pregnant and had the baby. And the, the maid and seeing the Buddha there went running to Sujata to, uh, tell her that the spirit had appeared 
and Sujata was bringing another offering to give to the spirit, but it was the Buddha uh, just after uh, having this memory. And he takes the food uh, and, uh, you know, thankfully drinks it, eats it. And uh, th- that gives him the energy to um, walk uh, several miles uh, to the Bodhi tree where he then sits down and, uh, you know, after three days uh, achieves his enlightenment. Um, so I'm using my psychoanalytic training to do a sort of cheap analysis of <laughs> the story. But, um, you know, the, the Sujata offering the Buddha the bowl of rice porridge is like the Buddha being given the breast. Um, mm-hmm. be- because to my mind, you know, the Buddha's mother, uh, who died when he was just a week old, um, that loss in the, in the Buddha's psyche, I think is there for modern day psychoanalysts to make something of because mm-hmm. so many of us come to meditation with a, a sense of something missing, something lacking, some kind of early loss doesn't have to be the death of our mother, but it might be like the, the yearning for some kind of acknowledgement or attention or love that we identify with, uh, often with the mother or the father, um, if only they weren't depressed or uh, alcoholic or getting divorced or, uh, you know, ill. Um, so the Buddha had that too. And just at this moment of remembering his childhood, Sujata appears. So I tell this story much more concisely in the book than I'm telling it now. (laughs) Uh, Just in a page or two, I managed to tell the story. Um, But I I think of that meeting of Sujata with the Buddha as a kind of metaphor for what in uh, Theravada Buddhism is called spiritual friendship. Uh, you probably know the Pali words for it, Shane. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's Kalyanamita. The Kalyanamita. Um, but I think of it also as a metaphor for what a good psychotherapy can be, you know, a spiritual friendship in which the uh, therapist, like Sujata, is offering what, what they can summon, you know, what they, mm-hmm. what they have available for a person who they really don't know uh, who or what that person could become, the way Sujata never knew this was a Buddha, you know, uh, mm-hmm. and that her nourishment was going to be the fuel that, uh, that could bring him to, uh, uh, to his enlightenment. Uh, so not to say that every therapy is... Uh, are going to be that efficacious to bring someone to their enlightenment. But, you know, it, it's a journey and a step on the way. And uh, we're, we're all uh, in, in these professions, you know, um, uh, there to do what we can for people. And if you think of all of our journeys as taking place over infinite lifetimes, you know, and mm-hmm. that these, these encounters... Uh, that you know that that I had with Danny Goldman and then with you and with mm-hmm. uh, Joseph and Jack and Ramdas and my own therapists and and reading Beyond and Winnicott and Yanaponica and so on you know that all, these are all my my spiritual friends so mm-hmm. uh, um, hopefully in my work as a therapist I can do a little bit of that for people too. Well, that's really beautiful. Um, one of the gifts of this book is how it demystifies what is often a private part of the human experience. I mean, just as you were just speaking and you were kind of uh, barely broaching the list of what people might go through, you know, when a parent is alcoholic or is negligent or is not there, is it, you know, and I was, I was listening and I thought, boy, that's a long list, you know? Yeah. Um, and yeah. one of the gifts the of list. the book really is. Yeah how it demystifies, you know, what people go through and people go through so much. And, and it's kind of a privilege in a way, and certainly an eye opener. It's like the Buddha leaving the palace, the Bodhisattva leaving the palace and encountering uh, the heavenly messengers, you know? So I would think like every day uh, being in that role is something like that. And it's also a, 
you know, our chance in reading this book is to basically be sitting in on someone else's therapy session. And, and it feels like a powerful way to destigmatize the challenges we all face, especially for those kind of internal experiences that we might not realize are so common in yeah. everyone. And I wonder if that's been like a reader reaction. Well, it was my reaction in, in the first place, just gathering the stories like, and then, and then spending time with them and reading through them. Like there's so many, so many incidents. Like there, there's one of a, um, a, a mother coming to visit her daughter who has two children in grade school in Brooklyn, you know, and the mm -hmm. mother's coming from the Midwest to stay and supposedly help uh, her daughter who's separated from the father, you know, and who's working full time and coming home uh, and has to make dinner. But the mother uh, doesn't cook. You know, the mother just uh, goes to Target and buys microwavable meals. And so my patient, who's the, uh, you know, the in, in the in-between, who's the mother of the two grade school kids, mm -hmm. my patient is coming to therapy and saying, you know, my mother's here, but she doesn't help. And I come home and, uh, uh, and then I have more work to do. And I was like, well, do you have a microwave? Which, of course, she didn't. And, then, and I said, well, could you, do you think your mother could get a microwave for you and then go to Target and get the meals and, <laughs> and at least make the meals for your kids? And that would be like a special treat for your kids to have microwavable meals. And we still talk, you know, I would have totally forgotten about that mm -hmm. session if I hadn't written it down. But then that's become a motif, you know in our uh, in our ongoing therapy because she listened you know she took that bit of advice mm -hmm. and and it helped and or there's another story of a um, my my patient who was uh had married uh she was the second wife of her current husband who had the husband had grown up children from his first marriage but the grown up children never related nicely to my patient who was mm -hmm. their stepmother and she was would come to therapy and be like can't they see what i'm doing for their dad like why can't they be like at least a little bit nice about it and uh i said something to her like you know like what you're wishing for is valid you know it's very reasonable but it's never going to happen you know mm -hmm. like so that gap between the way we uh, want things to be and expect things to be, but what, but, and reality, you know, I said like those, those kids, they're never going to turn on their biological mother, you know, mm -hmm. and favor you over her. That just, that just doesn't work like that. So, so um, the, you know, just the, just those ordinary problems that people face in their own little families, you know, but the Buddha's, uh, teachings, I've, uh, uh, you know, I don't have to say these are the Buddha's teachings, but right. I can just say, like, let's look at reality, you know, and try to cope, you know, how can we cope with reality in a, in a, an intelligent way? Um, you, you know, not in an angry way, not in a, not just in a frustrated way, but how can we try to salvage something out of this situation? Um, so, um, and I think like when you're teaching meditation and people are facing their own inner obstacles, I've heard you, you know, helping people in ways that I think are very similar where, where you're, you know, like get up off the cushion and like mm -hmm. do a little walking or send some love this way or right. Isn't it? Don't you, don't you see? Yeah. Well, I, yeah. I think the, the common time these days, uh, because of course there are phases in teaching as, as in everything, you know, but the common time I say it's never going to happen is when people ask a question uh, that has a certain kind of languaging in it, like how can I maintain mindfulness all day long? Or how can I keep the level of concentration that I, I got during the retreat? Or how can I never lose my temper with my children? Or how can I stop from ever being overwhelmed? So then I usually say, that's not going to happen. <laughs> it's not going to be that way. But mm -hmm. we learn how to recover. We learn how to recover more quickly. We learn how to start over. And hence the meditation instruction, like you're placing your attention somewhere, your attention wanders, you learn how to let go and come back. 
the the um, one of the last times that I was at the Forest Refuge, uh, mm-hmm. which was now it was probably four or five years ago now, but um, uh, there was a teacher there who I liked, a German uh, psychologist uh, teacher, um, and I had. I think in my first few days, uh, my meditation was uh, uh, very peaceful and, you know, a lot of joy coming up and then a kind of like what happened to it, you know? And I, and I was uh, uh, aware of spending the next couple of days, like trying, uh, trying too hard to resurrect the feeling that I, Mm -hmm. that I knew was possible, but it wasn't there anymore. Um, and I, and I went, you know, at the forest refuge, you only get an interview, you get like a 10 minute interview twice a week. So Mm -hmm. I, I I had to wait a few days to go for the interview, but I went and, and, uh, described what I knew I was, you know, like doing it wrong, but, Mm -hmm. uh, but I couldn't quite stop myself. And, and he said something to me like, don't chase her, Mark, let her find you. Ooh. Uh, (laughs) <laughs> and it wasn't that good. And he gendered it like that. Yeah. He, he gendered it like that. And, and, and something quivered inside of me when, when, when he did that, because I, because I thought, Oh, this guy understands me, you know, because in some way they, it, 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 that goes back to Sujata and the breast and the mother and the, mm-hmm. you know, what is it that we're seeking and what does meditation give us? And it, you know, the slightly erotic aspect of, you mm-hmm. know, some of the places that we find ourselves in meditation and how we get attached to that. Uh, anyway, all, all that, all that was there in his one little comment, you mm-hmm. know, don't chase her, but then that let her find you. Like that's the faith, the faith quality yeah. from yeah. beyond, you know, that, that it's, it's, it's that if we can learn to be patient and, just exist in the between that surprising things happen, you know, grace happens. Um, mm-hmm. uh, so anyway, somehow that, that experience on retreat, um, I think really influenced me in the way that I attempt to be a therapist also. Well, that's beautiful. I should say the forest refuge is, a retreat center up in Barry, Massachusetts, as part of the Insight Meditation Society. Um, we opened uh, IMS or the Insight Meditation Society in 1976, just a few years after Naropa Institute, uh, where we had met up, and uh, it was an it was an novitiate at the time that we bought it, and so uh, <laughs> we, uh, you know, and, which is a certain look at anyone who's gone to Catholic school or something like that. Well, no, the linoleum and like uh, just the And the, the pictures work. of Jesus. Come on. It's so great. I mean, everything, you know. So uh, it's been a long process of creating it to be within itself. Mostly, I think it's, it's uh, an extraordinary place vibrationally, you know, where yeah. so many people have come to meditate. And some years ago, we built another center in the woods, which is why it's called the Forest Refuge. Uh, where people do Mark, the kind of practice Mark was just describing. There's teacher support, but it's not so structured in the sense of, you know, uh, a discourse every night. And and uh, you have a lot more independence in, in that particular branch of of the scene. So um, it, it's really uh, interesting to me how so much comes back to a theme like, don't stigmatize to yourself what you're feeling and uh, have some ability to realize things break, you know, that's what happens. We fall down and we can get up again. And that's, that's the magic of it is that we can get up again. And uh, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on the struggle. So many people have with self-compassion and uh, sometimes much more so than offering compassion to others. And, even the very notion, I don't think I've taught physically, which of course has been a long time, but I don't think I've taught physically in a room about self-compassion without somebody raising their hand and talking about laziness, you know, that that's just indulgence. 
Well, I think self-compassion is the whole thing. That's more, yeah. more and more like the, um, the aspect of mindfulness that teaches patience, you know, that, uh, that allows us to create, and this is a psycho, psychodynamic language, but that allows us to create a holding environment uh, for our own minds and uh, you could say minds and hearts or for our own emotional um, uh-huh. uh, 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 bodies, you know, that, 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 that mindfulness is the creation of a holding environment for ourselves uh, and that that holding environment is analogous to what a, a, a parent instinctively does for an infant and for a young mm-hmm. child, that a, a parent instinctively doesn't abandon and or doesn't retaliate in the face of the entire range of their child's emotional experience. Mm -hmm. You know, that doesn't mean that they're not affected by it, that they don't feel frustration or pain or, or, um, uh, doubt or fear or anxiety, but they don't privilege, they naturally instinctively do not privilege their own emotional responses over that of their young child's. And, you know, that doesn't always happen, as we know. Uh, um, there are plenty of failures. Uh, all parents fail some, but the, um, the, the parents who are able to keep going learn how to survive their own failures and repair, you know, rupture and repair. They learn how to repair the, the tiny failures that occur. Um, so that a young child growing up in that kind of environment that has the support of the holding uh, capacity of the parents and gradually they, they internalize that so that they don't become afraid of the entire range of their own emotional experience. So my, my basic thought about mindfulness and about meditation psychologically anyway is that it's like a second chance uh, at uh, offering ourselves that kind of care or, or compassion, we could say, or uh, holding, you know, in the larger sense of holding, not just the mm-hmm. physical cradling, but uh, the, the creating a space in which uh, we know we can survive anything, even the most painful kinds mm. of uh uh, emotional experiences or, 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 um, reality experiences. Mm. Um, so I, it's, I think that's the aspect of mind. I used to see it, you know, oh, it's, it's a, um, uh, it's a psychological, uh, or an attentional, it's an attentional capacity that we're developing, you know, um, it, so it's, it's more scientific. It's more, it's more cognitive behavioral, you know, but now I think, oh, it's just, it's really all about the love, you know, that we're, we're creating an environment for ourselves that's actually all about the love. Mm, it's so beautiful. I love the book subtitle, which is Uncovering a Hidden Kindness in kindness. Life. Well, that's so. a better, that's a less, uh, uh, a sort of gentler way of trying to say the, the, the same thing, that that capacity for kindness which comes instinctively to parents in the face of their infant, that that capacity for kindness is there in all of us. That it's, you, you know, when we teach with um, Robert Thurman, Sharon, mm-hmm. and he talks about the uh, thousands of years, millions of years of evolution that has brought us into uh, a mammalian species where we're not laying eggs and sitting on our children, you know, in an egg, but uh-huh. we, we take the children into our bodies. We make them in our own bodies, you know, and that's so that they, the care that, that, uh, that we give to our own child is, it's, is, uh, instinctive and organic that, uh, that, that capacity is inherent to all of us, not just the mothers who are giving birth, but it, you know, we've all experienced it by virtue of, being an infant and we all have that ability 
that we can learn to apply to our own experience. There's some description that Bob does that I have to find somewhere, some transcript where, uh, and maybe it has to do with this idea of kindness or compassion too, because he's saying we don't have kind of the marks of strength as human beings. We don't have the marks of strength of like, you know, scales, <laughs> like an alligator or, you know, giant jaws and teeth and, you know, we have to find strength in another way that, and that is a quality like kindness. Yeah. But of course it's, it's Bob. It's done as only Bob can do it. So. As only Bob can do. That's right. <laughs> so do you think there are any limitations to kindness in the world that we live in today? We, you know, you hear a term like um, compassion fatigue quite often. Oh, I think, well, that's one of the beautiful things about Buddhism is the way it so uh, skillfully interweaves the wisdom and compassion, you know? Um, so the intelligence, the intelligence and the kindness. So, you, you know, always, always the balance between the two. So that, that too much intelligence and not enough kindness, you know, uh, brings you the atom bomb. And, mm -hmm. uh, uh, too much, too much kindness without the intelligence, you know, just has people, um, uh, falling on their faces, you know, or, or getting exhausted from, cause they're trying to take care of, uh, everybody with their own two hands. Mm -hmm. So, you yeah. know, that, that idiot compassion phrase, yeah, which is, which is a little mean, but, uh, um, yeah. but, but <laughs> says it, says it yeah. succinctly. Yeah. I've done some amount of work with frontline healthcare workers and mm -hmm. uh, certainly read about or know many who are in that position. And, and so many are existing in a space beyond burnout these days. And I'm curious, I, you know, I realized, Oh, I should really put school teachers often in that, in that category of totally. people who are just now I'm thinking about therapists, you know, like, yeah. Well, this, the, the therapists have it easy because they can stay in their little rooms with their computers and, you know, and talk to people from the comfort of their own homes. Mm -hmm, the, mm -hmm. the teacher, the teachers are much more frontline, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I'm sure there are therapists who are frontline and uh, not working from the same place of privilege that, that I am and that I'm thinking about. But, mm -hmm. but the teachers, the teachers are, uh, you know, have to deal with the, with the kids and the buildings and the parents and the administration. And, you know, it's, they're not dealing with one patient at a time or one kid at a time. They're, they're really, you know, so, so, uh, undervalued and overworked. So that would be beautiful, Sharon. Yeah. I mean, it's of course, you know, massive and, um, you know, the, there seems to be such a, a crisis, not only in frontline workers like that, but just in mental health, you know, all together. And um, it's just a challenging time with a lack of resources that is also true for many. Completely. So I'm wondering what guidance you have for anyone seeking a therapist for the first time. This is a question somebody uh, gave to me to ask you. So how do you recommend approaching the therapeutic setting as a first timer? Well, uh, one good thing that's come out of COVID is the remote therapy. But as I was saying uh, before, it, it's actually um, a lot more effective, um, a, a lot more helpful than, uh, than I would have thought even being a therapist, you know? Mm -hmm. So uh, it used to be that you had to live in a big urban center to find a decent therapist, but, but now it's really possible to, uh, to reach out. There are all, all kinds, you know, just uh, uh, going online, there, there's a, a million ways to be led to uh, good therapy. All the, um, all the university centers, for instance, all the medical schools, uh, throughout the country, they all have departments of psychiatry. Um, so even people with, you, you know, uh, um, mental illness, emotional illness that might require medication, um, you know, it's, it's, there's, there's a lot of help out there. And uh, there are training institutes for uh, psychotherapy, not just for psychiatrists, but 
for psychotherapists who don't need medical degrees. There are freestanding uh, training therapy training institutes that people could just Google. Um, and there, there are um, uh, trainees you, who will see you for cheap. There are more experienced therapists if you have insurance or can pay a private fee. But um, the, it's the kindness of the therapist that, uh, that is going to be the most important thing healing-wise and the personal connection that gets established. So, um, it, you know, I, I always say that it's really just like a friendship. And if you feel that this person uh, who you're talking to has some understanding and likes you, and if you like them, uh, the therapy is likely to be is likely to be successful. And now there are also, you know, it's a big, it's a big, um, uh, it's a big thing in the app world. Uh, I think that uh, there, there are a lot of venture capitalists and software designers moving into the therapy world mm-hmm. and, uh, and probably they're, they're going to do good work. You know, it's probably just another, the same way uh, uh, podcasts have uh, transformed the way we listen to the radio. I'm sure mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. there's, um, you know, um, so I, 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 I really believe in therapy and that I think it's a, um, uh, it's a unique thing in our culture. It's a, sort of a miracle in our culture that it exists, that, that two people can be together, uh, in one form or another with no agenda other than to say whatever is happening in the moment, you know, in each of their emotional experiences and that, that, that becomes something that is a, uh, um, a healing art. Well, that's a wonderful thing to really reflect on. I know so many conversations I've had on zoom, uh, <laughs> with people where somebody uh, about some issue or, uh, a webinar we're going to try to create or, you know, some project and, uh, if we do a brief check-in in in the beginning, somebody on the call will say, I realized I needed some help and I reached out and I feel much better now. That's great. Well, the other thing, you know, um, uh, uh, AA, uh, all the 12 step groups, Mm -hmm. like that's an incredible therapeutic, uh, world. And, um, most of most people who come to see me in particular for therapy come because they have a friend who has seen me in therapy and Mm -hmm. the friend says, you know, uh, says something uh, nice about me that, 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 uh, um, uh, uh, creates interest. So I think asking your friends also, you know, uh, who might have a therapist, that's, that's sort of like the, uh, uh, the quickest route to finding somebody. Great. Well, Thank you so much for being here with me. I feel like we could go on for like eight hours, which would be such joy. <laughs> but, <yeah. laughs> uh, before we finish, I would love it if you want to lead us in some kind of guided practice or reflection, uh, whether it's a meditation or reading something from your book, whatever. <laughs> well, I've always heard you say, uh, um, rest the body, rest the body on the cushion Mm-hmm. Uh, or in the chair, on the couch, on the floor, and then rest the mind in the body mm-hmm. the way you rest the body on the cushion. Mm-hmm. So that so um, so that's what I would start with, you know, for for uh, people who want a little guidance into the meditation. Like find a comfortable place to sit, feel what the body's doing. Feel all the places that the body is being supported by the earth, by the chair, by the cushion, by the couch. And then feel into your mind and rest the mind in the body the way the body rests on the cushion. Rest the mind in the body. And rest your attention in the mind the way the butterfly hovers over the flower. So just allow, just get yourself 
as out of the way as possible without removing yourself from your experience. So just allow everything to be just as it is right now. Feeling the body, listening to the sounds, allowing the silence, hearing the thoughts, feeling the feelings, and allowing it all to quiver and wriggle, vibrate and change and sense somehow that along with all that, all those phenomena coming and going, that there's some kind of peacefulness, some kind of quiet, some kind of rest, that's there in the spaces. And allow those spaces to be in your consciousness as well. Thanks, Sharon. Oh, well, thank you so much. It's, it's a lovely, lovely reflection. And thank you so much for joining me today. To learn more about Mark's work, you can visit his website at markepsteinmd.com, M-A-R-K-E-P-S-T-E-I-N-M-D.com, and get yourself a copy of The Zen of Therapy in hardcover, ebook, or audiobook format, wherever books are sold. Big thank you to everyone who's listening. This has been the Meta Hour podcast from the Be Here Now Network. May you be safe, be happy, be healthy, and may you live with ease. Hey folks, thanks for listening. To learn more about Sharon and her ongoing teaching schedule, as well as online courses and a free guided meditation, check out her website at SharonSalzberg.com.